So uh, thanks, Andres, for coming on to the show. Um, today, we're both, both a bit of like champagne nerds, actually. Uh, I, I can't believe how many bottles you've got at your place. Um, I got this one, a Deep Old Valois, uh, one of my favorite sort of like little niche champagne producers um, uh, from Cremont, which is like a village that grows mostly Chardonnay. So I really like that one. Um, what's, what's your favorite? What are you drinking at the minute? Very nice. I basically have all of the bottles that people bring over for New Year's parties that we throw. And so we've been throwing a New Year's party every year for the last like five years. And so I've just got a, a cellar full of wine bottles uh, of champagne that I really have no idea what, what uh, what's there. But uh, here you go. Pretty okay, little well, anyway. uh, fizzy substance cheers. here. Uh, so cheers. Thanks for coming Tell on the show. Ching, ching. I've also got my coffee here as well. It's, it's morning for me. Um, so I can't drink too much of this um, <laughs> evening for you. But yeah, look, I, um, I was talking to a colleague actually recently and we're, we're talking about experimentation and, you know, the good way to do it. And of course, you know, product management sort of comes up in, in this and product led growth and all that kind of thing. And, and yeah, I listened to some of your existing uh, interviews and I just found them really interesting because I think you got a bit of a unique take on it having, having been there through the the original days of what we'd call the web to all the way till today, which I'm sure is quite <laughs> different. Um, but your, your, your story started at working for the world's first digital agency. Um, can you tell me about that? Like how did all that start? Yeah, it was uh, just through happenstance and through a weird connection with one of my best friends from growing up. I stumbled upon this agency and they were the very first online agency. And I thought what they were doing was the coolest thing ever. And as a result, I took a pay cut I flew cross country. I left my job at, at Boeing of all places and just took whatever job I could wow. get to get my foot in the door there and uh, managed to find myself working on the Disney store online. And so the Disney store online was brand new. They were trying to get customers and we were helping them place links online. But as a result, we sort of very accidentally started running some of the very first online experiments, which uh, was just such a treat for me. So it's really funny after all these years, how, how much... Uh, that has been a seminal part of my experience and it just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again in, in a pretty profound way. Yeah, nice. Okay. And um, like- I can tell you a little bit more about the experience there if you'd like to. And yeah, I can no, tell you I mean, more about the experience totally there online too, at, 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 at iTraffic. It was really, it was wild. It was the early days of the internet, um, which just sort of like repeated itself in terms of boom and bus cycles. And I lived all the way through that. Um, but it was actually one of those really cool, do you this mind is, if I go on a little, just, like, like gray hair tangent here? Yeah. Yeah. But this is, this is just before dot com boom. Right. So this is like 98, like let's just put 98, 97 or something like that. Is it? Or yeah, yeah. I flew across country. I interviewed 97 and it started on January 5th or 4th, 1998. Um, I could afford to eat one meal a day. It was so before dot com boom, there was no money there. I could literally afford to eat one meal a day. That meal was called, it was called meal is lunch. And that's the meal you get when you want the most food for your money. And uh, I literally, I dropped so much weight. I was just barely getting by. I lived in a room with no windows uh, that had a, you know, just outside of a kitty litter box. It, it was, it was pretty terrible. Uh, but the internet boomed around me in the next, uh, over the course of the next six months, got promoted three times uh, during that crazy boom and, uh, and kind of rode, rode the first rocket ship up saw all of the mistakes that people were making, had early data well before everyone did, and was able to sort of correct, like figure out my self-correction before that uh, along the way. Wow. Okay. And um, when it comes to like testing experimentation, um, not many tools I'm gathering, like what were you doing there? Just manual sort of like updates oh my and God. things of that? Or? John, what we spent the entire week doing was we would uh, figure out ways of sending sort of two versions of, of, of all things of a banner, if you can believe that, but two versions of an ad to, to Yahoo at the time or Lycos, the early portals. And we would send them different versions of a banner. And one had Winnie the Pooh on it and one did not. And it said just Disney Store Online. And we could see by systematically varying those ads uh, and having all of these track links, uh, what was the effect of including a Winnie the Pooh on a banner in terms of the number of incremental sales on a little plush doll. But in order to do that, I literally spent, oh gosh, like 40, 50 hours that week, just cobbling together the data from all of the different sources so that five minutes before my client call, I could actually have enough of an analysis to say, oh my goodness, this is what we did. We dropped the cost per customer. We cost cost per sale down by 40%. And that was reason to celebrate, except for the fact that it was still 
costing at that point, like five times more than a Winnie the Pooh called Winnie the Pooh doll would sell for. So it was a very, like, it was one of those moments in time where you, no matter how good a job you did at optimizing down, you realize that there was an impending doom that was about to fall on the industry. And sure enough, it did about eight months later. So Urchin tracking, sort of, well, Urchin was like the original um, analytics program before it was bought by Google, right? So you're probably using UTM codes and things like that for, for tracking or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were, um, it was just adding, yeah, it was actually additional codes and links and tracking links all the way through. There was, it was zero automation in this. The automation looked like my fingers wow. pressing keyboards and pressing numbers into a keyboard to get a spreadsheet going. And it was all done through spreadsheets. It was, it was a mess. Wow. Hey, so let's just fast forward a bit. But um, before that, you studied behavioral science and you come from a family of scientists as well. So like, do you think that sort of shaped your background uh, from a, I would say, a more of an empirical basis or, you know, a formally trained background in behavioral science that sort of like given you a, an edge when you start to move into this space? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's just sort of in my bones in some regards. Um, I used to go to my dad's lab as a kid on like Saturday mornings, he'd take me to his lab and he'd dissect frogs and show me the big computers and the things he was working on and how the nervous system worked. And uh, it was just awesome. I loved it. And, uh, you know, fast forward several years later when I find myself in college and I've got an economics class that's followed by a psychology class and I'm realizing, wait, these two things are so similar. They're telling the exact same story, but just from the opposite sides of a coin. And I realized if I could put them together, we could have a pretty profoundly interesting story. And so there's no such thing as behavioral economics at the time, at least not as a formal discipline. And so I got the college to allow me to mash them up and I created my own little, uh, my own little, uh, major, which is amazing. Um, years later, actually kind of funny, Dan Ariely is, is now an investor in my company and he's sort of like one of these people that's really well known for popularizing behavioral economics too. But it was one of those things where it's just like the ability, and I remember actually my senior thesis being able to prove out the inconsistency of user preference and using psychology to sort of uh, help probe and invalidate kind of some of the principles of, of, uh, of economics. Um, happy to go into that too, but that's super nerdy and, and way, way into the details. And it's also about 30 years ago. So my, my de the details are going to start getting hazy for me. Oh, well, it's probably for a topic for another day. But yeah, one of my good friends, she's, uh, she did behavioral psychology, <laughs> or behavioral economics in detail. Um, yeah, actually, the university I went to, they sort of they have a really good department around that. So, but yeah, very interesting area. I mean, it's sort of leading that economic outcome to, um, you know, psychology. Um, so it's like looking at the action that happens, a valuable action from or per, a person buying something in a, in a market situation with using psychology as right. a basis. So um, I find it really interesting. Um, well, but yeah, I, I just find, um, yeah, anyway, I was reading this article the other day and I noticed that you also uh, were one of the original proponents of the Lean Startup before perhaps it was called Lean Startup and Al Reese's book came out. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we were sort of an accidental Lean Startup uh, at Meetup. And so um, basically what, what ended up happening with us is that uh, very early on, we realized that um, very, very early on, we realized that, that if we could start running experiments, um, we could more, we could do a lot better than we were doing when, in terms of getting results from the things we we're launching. And so invariably what happens and what would happen in the pre-lean startup days is that we would um, um, Trying to think about how to make this an interesting, an interesting part of the story. John, can we pause and, and re restart here, or is that going to mess you up? Oh yeah, yeah. I edit the whole thing. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I, cool. I heavily edit cool. everything. So, like, yeah, to make. It All right, cool. Good. I'm trying. I want to get like, to the good like, stuff like, for you too, and I want to help you get to. I, I know well, you're trying. You're trying to angle to some good stuff, but I want to help you get there too. So, no, no, no worries on my part, but uh, but help, help. Well, it's more that like um, like this. I really want to like surface some good stories, right? but. Yeah, it's like, it's like Lean Startup's been around for a while. It was po popularized by the book, right? And then sort of permeated into tech culture from there. And then I've just recently read an article which really, from Reforge, actually. I, again, it's, you know, it's Reforge, their, their growth um, training mm -hmm. company, obviously. Um, everyone has their angle, right? I get it. But also, I found some of the, the points he was making are, around why not to use the Lean Startup method somewhat interesting and, and sort of valid in my experience. So I'll run through the four and maybe you can talk to that. Um, the four points was one, it encourages agnostic experimentation instead of starting with a compelling strategy. So there's this tactical versus strategy sort of friction there. If you don't have strategy or some sort of macro guidance, then you can just optimize things that 
aren't really pushing the button. Number two, a focus on MVPs mm -hmm. leads to failing too fast. Um, number three, it leads to incremental product improvement instead of step change products or you know uh, product line improvements or new products in particular. Uh, and and lastly, it overemphasizes mm -hmm. the focus on product over deliberate growth. So it orientates the whole organization to focus too much on product instead of maybe some other things that contribute to the sale, like brand, um, the market at large, and so on and so forth. So what would you say to those four? Yeah, I think it's fascinating and, and I sort of joke that today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. And, and so, you know, people are going to take the Lean Startup, which was a really revolutionary idea at the time and profoundly changed how business was done in a way that was wildly important. And I can give a little bit of context around that. And right now you're sort of finding folks saying, well, it doesn't work in this instance, or it doesn't work in this instance, and it doesn't work in this instance. Those are probably, there, there's individual situations and circumstances where that makes sense and where they're probably right. The reality though, is that there's sort of like the underlying principles and what are the first principles behind it all? And the first principles behind all experimentation and all experimentation as it relates to business and, and lean startup movement is really um, a humility to understand that probably what you think is gonna happen is probably not actually what's gonna happen. That your grasp of the world, your grasp of the truth is limited by your own experience. And everyone, no matter who you are, and I learned this from, from my experiences running hundreds of, like creating a usability program that ran hundreds of, of split tests of, of usability sessions a year, which is that, that basically how people perceive that others use technology is almost always driven by how they perceive it. And if you watch somebody else use technology, you realize how flawed your point of view is. If you've ever tried to direct your parents in using an iPhone or using an Android, or if you're, you're trying to help somebody navigate around and you just watch somebody use things, it is mind boggling to you how different they use it. And the same is true across not just an individual user case, but across like broad swaths of users. And so what, when people critique running experiments or they critique the lean startup movement against other ideas, it's really sort of around saying, do you believe that there is an underlying truth around user behavior and that there's sort of a way that if it was done in a certain way, it would more likely than not unlock a big idea. And the answer to that is the only way you're going to really find out is either by watching every single person do it or by using scientific method through experimentation to be able to suss that out. Now there are super, so well, like well, if you don't commit to running something as an experiment, you're never going to really truly learn. You're just guessing. Right. And I know from experience, from experience that 80% of experiments that people run according to Optimizely on their platform do not move the needle. And if you just sort of use that as 80% of the things that people are experimenting with and just say, well, maybe that applies to 80% of the things that people aren't experimenting, that are people are just trying. It means that you're right once for every five times you try. You're wrong four times for every one time you're right. And that's a profoundly like terrible hit rate. And, and so the ultimate game and what lean startup or whatever you want to describe, what experimentation is about, what our job is as an industry is to try and change that ratio, to try and invent new things, try and make new things happen in a way that actually people will actually use. And it's far easier than it's ever been to launch stuff. It's harder than ever to launch stuff that people use. And, and that's the entire game. And so we can sort of unpack each, each of the individual things around saying, well, um, does it lead to not having a larger strategy? Well, when you have a larger strategy and you need to make big bets, you still want to run experiments. You could say, well, Uber, as an example, Uber um, placed billion dollar bets at a certain point in its lifetime around going global. Why could they make that kind of bet with such vigor? Besides the fact that they had a humongous, uh, <laughs> and a lot of people willing to pour a lot of money into them, but why would you be able to do that with such confidence? And the answer is because in a small market, in an initial market, which was San Francisco, it was taking off. The usage was there. The data was there to say, if the rest of the world looks like the behaviors in San Francisco, it will scale to the world. And so is that an experiment? Yes. They sort of, San Francisco is an early experiment that gave them confidence in terms of that it's a good idea to make the bet and then to inform how to make the bet as they scale to the rest of the world. 
And, and so okay, well, that's a um, perfect example of making like pretty profoundly large changes that are not necessarily incremental, but that are, are and that are global in nature based on running, thinking about how you define an experiment or where are you seeking truth from and being really, really smart about where you seek truth to tip the odds of being right in your favor. Okay, I love it. I mean, that's sort of what I do with strategy. You know, you do a research phase, you might do small sort of pilot tests and things like that, but we'll come to that in a moment because I, I think you raise a good point. We need to define what is experimentation? Like, is it different to testing? Is it different to research? Where do you draw the line here if we have to define what it is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I sort of think of it as the discipline pursuit of truth. And, and so um, our like job, you know, in our lifetimes, our life starts, what, what's that? Like epistemology, <laughs> if you had to use like a, a technical word. <laughs> yeah, well, help me understand that more. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, epistemology is just like a... Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this definition, but it's like um, the search for defining, you know, what is true and right and, and what is not, basically, um, through basically the scientific method. That mm -hmm. it's like a discipline about you know, bordering on philosophy, I would say, but with a scientific edge. So, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I look at it from the point of just being right and wrong, you know, or like, am I wasting my time or am I making good use of my time? I, I have I have a day to day to try and make a difference on something. Right. And so what I believe experimentation is about is about looking for signals as fast as you possibly can. And maybe experimentation is too broad a word, but but I think our job, you know, as, as growth and product leaders in the world is generally around trying to figure out how to get the fast signal to make the best use of the little resource, the, the precious resource we have, which is really time and the time of the people around us to make a difference on other people. And we do that. And what's cool about our industry is that we can do that through product and products and technology and marketing and various channels. And so we can do that to a lot, like, and affect a lot of people in a very short period of yeah. time. Um, and we just okay. need to have the humility to know that. Go ahead. So is there different types of, of experimentation? Like if you had to categorize them into like, well, there's this sort of branch and this branch or that type or that type, or is it just a philosophy that, is a, a cultural mindset and sort of a process that, that goes over all these different functions? Yeah, it's a really great question. I Experimentation might be too broad a term, um, and, and um, but I use it as my shorthand. <laughs> and so the shorthand really is for, in terms of the different types, of course, it's about what are the ways in which you can learn. And, in behavioral sciences, it's around quantitative research versus qualitative research. It's around sort of learning yeah. from other people's studies versus learning directly uh, from firsthand accounts and experiences or running it in, in a survey. Um, all of those things are just approximations of truth. And so what we're generally like, as, as the sciences are doing this, humanities are doing this, everyone's doing this, is trying to approximate and make sense of the world around them. And what's wonderful to me about the notion of using thinking about things as experiments is really around can you systematically vary the experiences or systematically approach can you approach things in a systematic way ideally by varying them in a certain way but to rapidly gain signal about what is likely to be a good use of your time and not a good use of your time and then quickly double down on those things and so whatever gets yeah, the no, job done I, i'm the most pragmatic scientist you'll ever meet in that regard and, and being willing to live with a okay. ton of error. Like there's be so much error along the way. But the alternative to that error is even more error, is 80%. You're, like the benchmark is 80% fail. <laughs> Can you get that down to 60? You're, you're doing so much better. You've just doubled your hit rate. Well, I definitely right, want to unpack to that in terms of like cultural mindset in a minute. Um, before we get there though, I also, is this valid for different, like for all companies, like I know you've done a lot of work in tech and SaaS world, obviously. Um, and obviously that mm -hmm. culture I find tends to be a bit more receptive to this mindset of open experimentation. Um, it's not, it's a bit less ego driven. Okay. I say that with a huge caveat, but it's, it's less about, Hey, I'm an <laughs> experienced ex manager. I know what I'm doing versus, okay, well, let's find out. I've got a hypothesis. Let's test the hypothesis. It tends to skew more into that sort of culture. Now, um, does this mindset and, and this sort of experimentation phase, um, does that apply to traditional businesses? 
um, is it more applicable to early stage or hmm. middle or late stage companies? Like, is there a sweet spot for, for this kind of discipline? Such a great question. What would be a traditional industry? What would be an example of that? Well, let's just say like an FMCG company, maybe a CPG company, a consumer packaged goods or something like, let's just say it's tied or, you know, whatever like that. Um, and I, again, this is a product example. I don't work, yeah. in, product, work in services, a bit more complex, um, but like, would they be doing experimentation or would they be just, they have their systems and processes and agencies and vendors and they just brief them and bang, they go and do it. Well, in, in theory, they're the granddaddies and grandmamas of, of, of experimentation. So they, they were running experiments <laughs> okay, in example. small markets in Ohio, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, like during the Mad Men era of, uh, of, of advertising. And so they were sort of the, the OGs, the originals. Uh, in this world, okay, 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 uh, with okay, regard to example, like applying scientific example. method to business. Okay. Okay. Well, then let's go your local uh, taqueria or your local restaurant. Um, let's just say like a family line <laughs> run little okay. restaurant, a diner or something like that, right? Um, would it apply to them? Yeah. What a great question. So um, traditional experiments as like if from a tech point of view does require two things, which is a fair amount of scale to get the data. And then the second question is, let's say you learned to get it. Let's say they did learn to do something that resulted in a 3% lift. Is it worth the effort to do all that work to get a 3% lift if your daily traffic volume is 15 people in an hour, you know, in an hour? Maybe, maybe not, uh, right? Maybe what they need is much more profound impact uh, on that regard. I've run the experiments like in my own personal use cases, like when I was a ballpark vendor and I, I was able to get a 20% lift in my daily tips as a result of running experiments, you know? So I think it applies. I, I think this is a really it's good example. It's certainly not limited I, to being small. Can you tell me about that? Because um, I did listen to one of your other podcasts and they did talk about this peanut thing. And I, I think you raised a very good point, but can you just tell the story? And then um, I'd, I'd like to ask you some specifics about your technique there. So um, one of your, I'll just set the scene, yeah. you were in college and, and you had a sort of a part-time sort of casual job um, selling peanuts at what, baseball games was it? Wrigley and Comiskey Field. Yep. <laughs> the White Sox and the Cubs Park. Okay. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. So pretty famous. And then um, and what you were selling peanuts and you noticed that some very specific details around the way you sold these things would improve um, the the take home cash that you could take every day. So just tell me sort of what, what you learned there. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, so again, I said, I am super nerdy and experimentation and, and running these uh, kind of pattern recognition is in my bones and I love doing it. Uh, but, but when I was a ballpark vendor, you only make what you sell. So whatever you sell is what you're making that day, plus your tips. And so uh, right. when I would sell peanuts at Wrigley Field, which is where the Cubs play, um, I would systematically vary all the things around what I would do to see what would drive the most results. And at the time, I didn't know how to use spreadsheets. I actually used Intuit's Quicken program that was on my parents' computer to track my sales. And so I would know... When I did what, what would happen? And what I discovered was when I would sell people a bag of peanuts, which was $2.25 at the time, and I would use a certain phrase, I would say, and you get 75 cents as your change. I would say you twice. I would make, be much more likely to get the tip. And I would basically walk home that day with an extra 20 bucks in my pocket, which on a good day, I would make about $100. So that's like a 20% lift which is ridiculous money for a college student at the time. It was a great, great day for four, four hours of work. Um, but it was one of those things where it's like, okay, that little conjunction, maybe, look, maybe if, I, if I'm being on it, like if I'm being like a scientist now and say, well, is your sample size big enough to, to, to merit that? Like, do you actually, is it consistent? Maybe I'm totally flawed and it's just within the random chance. Uh, but I actually do really think that those things do matter. And as a result, now when I'm running experiments and I'm trying things, I'm actually much more likely to try and use you <laughs> in my copywriting uh, because I do believe that it makes a, a, a very big difference in people's response rates. I'm actually trying to monitor so, for so, experiments involving that as well. So you basically guilt trip so them into it, like it's like hey, a lifelong hypothesis. It's been following me now for 30 years. 
What's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, all, all, like you basically guilt trip them by saying you twice and making them feel guilty that the fact that it was their money that you were giving back to them. And then they sort of like maybe mentally registered, oh, actually, I should give give a tip. Um, so maybe it was like this double use of you that sort of um, that made sense of that. But um, it yeah, look, might have been guilt. It's entirely like, possible. Yeah, I also think it made them a player in the overall scene. And so the other thing that I was very aware of is that when you're at a ballpark, you're there to not just see a game, you're there to be a part of the overall experience. And so it's entirely possible that by naming them in the experience and calling them out, uh, it created a stronger awareness of it. Uh, these are all theories, right? Like, but these are the underlying theories. What we, what's our data point? What's our signal is that saying it worked. We know that there's an outcome uh, we can unpack the why behind it, and that would probably be something we could do with with a lot of qualitative research or uh, over time. Yeah, great. Okay, well, I think it's just a really good example because um, I think perhaps in this field, yeah. like you'll get your in growth and and product and and marketing in general and sales. Um, there's sometimes this belief that there's this macro. I'll be a big bigger picture thinker. The small details don't matter. In my experience. Um, when you're responsible for the financial outcome, and sometimes if it's your money, um, you quickly realize that the details actually really do matter. Like the tone of your voice, the specific phrasing and words that you use um, to close a sale makes or breaks your percentages by a large, large margin. I know, um, and I'm going to cover this soon, but like a sales team, um, uh, he says that he has to sack or, or fire at least 20 to 30% of all people, regardless of how good the salesperson is, just because their skill set, even if they're a really good salesperson using all the right phrases and stuff, it just doesn't gel with product they're selling. And he has to keep cutting this, this bottom half. And that's he's found as the best way to optimize the sales team. And it's just, it's, it's brutal, but it's just it's a part of the job. And um, yeah, some people have very good tone. It's not what you say, but how you say it, that really clinches the deal. And I noticed you said in the, in the peanut example that you found a particular type of, was it 1920s kind of like transatlantic sort of like TV <laughs> accent uh, worked really well because perhaps it was distinctive and, and uh, people noticed it from, from the noise around the stadium. I don't know. What's, what's your theory on that? Yeah. That's exactly right. I had a 1920s vendor voice. Uh, I wasn't wearing suspenders <laughs> or the little hat, but uh, but but I had 1920s vendor voice, which is like, hey, peanuts, get your peanuts, yeah. Uh, that was a, a real real part of what uh, what was again creating the experience. But it kind of cut above the noise. It, it, it like was able to be heard. Um, it was very clear, and it also created a bit of a show, and people wanted to be a part of the show. You know, similarly, when I throw a bag of peanuts, if I you know throw throw a bag of peanuts. To two people in one little section, you probably sell another four bags because people just want to catch the dang thing, right? So there's sort of what you're selling, but it's also sort of the larger experience, uh, which are all part of these things that were just like silly and systematically varied, but these details do matter, kind of going back to your underlying question. And, and so the reality is, is that when you sort of have, um, even at the smallest of levels, the, they do make a difference. And, and so I feel like wherever there is behavior you want to change, which is pretty much the job of any organization, more or less, is trying to change behavior, be it a business, be it a nonprofit, a political organization. Everyone's trying to get people to behave in a certain way. And that buying into or understanding the drivers, understanding what triggers will cause certain actions in certain ways is the thing that's most likely to yield that result. So I do believe that it's sort of a part of everything. I also believe that it can be done wrong and it can be done way too much. And I know that because I've done both. <laughs> I've been guilty very much of both, right? At, at Meetup, when we started embracing lean startup mo movement and experimentation, our, our results started like growing really wildly. We started growing really, really fast. And so what happened? We said, let's double the size of our experimentation team. And we did, and we got even better results. And then we said, let's double it again. Let's keep growing. Let's make everyone run everything as an experiment. And what invariably ended up happening is that people got hooked on the sauce. They got hooked on being right, and they got very scared of being wrong. And what ends up happening is you end up experimenting too much and experimenting on things that don't matter. 
And that's the problem with the, like, if there was a critique of the lean startup movement, if there's like a critique of anything, sugar, whatever, exercise, whatever good thing done too much generally can be a bad thing. I don't know if sugar could ever be a good thing in that regard. It, it is tasty, but uh, taking it to an extreme is a very bad thing uh, in general. And the same is very much true for experimentation, uh, which is when experimentation replaces judgment, it leads to bad outcomes. When experimentation informs okay. judgment, it leads well, to that's profound exactly change. what I want to ask you next. Because I have noticed this with a couple of startups that I advise, um, that they perhaps, um, how's the best way to put this? Um, they embrace this data-driven sort of experimentation mindset, right? Um, but I've noticed the human error comes at the start of that process, which is <laughs> the first thing, which is coming up with what to experiment on. <laughs> And often it's something that they personally think yes. is really important or a good idea that they've always wanted to test out of curiosity or whatever, instead of something perhaps that they should be doing some prioritization and maybe from objective perspective around the ideas to test in the first place. So they use this really good experimentation method, really data-driven, blah, 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 but they've, they've chosen the, perhaps a really unwise thing to test in the first place. That if you had perhaps training or more experience or like a professional experience around behavioral psychology, you wouldn't be doing that because you kind of already know that there's indicative laws that would say that that is a bad idea to do. And that's already been proven. So why are you testing that thing again? Um, what would you say to that? Mm -hmm. um, you're hundred percent right, which is, you know, um, your experiments will only be as good as the ideas you try. Your ad copy that you upload into Google, you can upload any ad you want into Google and Google is going to optimize the heck out of it for you. It's going to give you, it's going to help you know what message works or doesn't work. It, what it won't let you do is know is the gazillions of other messages you could have tried. It doesn't tell you like what will be better from everyone else, right? Or from other places. In a similar way, those experiments that those people are running, um, it's so funny to hear you talk about like how systematic they are and rigorous and especially on a small scale, because oftentimes people clutch onto that because they're just dying not to be wrong. Uh, they're just so scared of being wrong that there's sort of a, a fallacy that if I can do things in a very scientific way, that that will make my error go away. And the reality is that error is a part of everything we do. Every experiment, even the best experiments run by, you know, pharmaceutical companies have error in them. There's error is part of everything. And it's about sort of how to deal with it in the right level. But to your point, I think you're 100% right. Now, there's frameworks that people can use. There's a framework like... Uh, what's the reach? What's the impact? What's your perceived confidence? Uh, what's the level of effort that you might go into it? So you can sort of score things on those dimensions, which really does help have a conversation about what to do or not do. Well, what's happening with every one of these scores? Those scores are all based on your perceived judgment, some of which are true. So reach is very easy. That one's easy to do. Effort is kind of easy to do. You can sort of know how many weeks it might take unless you're wrong, plus or minus, which is often is more, right? Double it. Impact and confidence though, you're guessing. Reality is you're guessing, right? Like you don't have the data until after you do the thing. And so how do you guess? Well, the reason why people who have been, you know, in the industry for so long generally have a better hit rate is because they've run more experiments. And so their guesses are more informed by the things that others have done or that, that have worked for them in the past. Um, but there's even with that personal judgment, with that experience, you, you're, you're still going to have a fair number of things that are going to miss. The point being is that know that up front, you're guessing <laughs> and use that and understand, okay, well, what do I do before I run the test? What signal can I get before I try something to give me a reason to believe that it's worth doing? Sometimes the easiest thing to do is to have a conversation like the one I'm having with you right now, right? And, and just with somebody who's a potential buyer and say, you know, help me understand, is this really a problem? Is it a qualitative thing? There's other experiments you can do like with Google ads to run them. You can look at what other people are running in, in experiments too. There's so many different places where you can learn and all you're really trying to do is, 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 is you know, inform your perceived level of impact, your perceived level of confidence in being right so that you can tilt the you know, the, the eventual outcomes in your favor, assuming you get enough shots at it. Okay. I really want to talk about that because you kind of just mentioned the rice method there, which is around prioritization of you know, when you're in product management, you want to, you have all these ideas coming in from all these different departments. And you're like, you've got to really heavily prioritize, okay, what are we going to do? Because, you know, it involves resources and time 
which, you know, are two things that are in very short supply in the startup world and you're trying to hit targets. So you've got to like, you know, somehow totally. support these things and then come up with, okay, what are we going to do? What are we not going to do? Um, which is generally a product management strategy. But um, what I found is that like I was trained formally in marketing and one of the units that we did was consumer psychology. Obviously, I then read sort of books on, on top of that, um, you know, with scientific references in papers that have been validated um, already with experiments, you know, in, um, okay, I know the research world and journal world isn't always as highbrow as perhaps people may think, and they do isolate variables from a very complex reality, that is the world when you're doing live testing. Um, so they're isolating variables, in, in, you know, single variables instead of testing all of them in, in situation a lot of the time. Um, so there are like problems with that, but I found if um, I had a, a background in that, then I would be a lot more, I would think about experiments in a very different way than when I was perhaps working with engineers and um, technical founders who didn't have that background. Um, and they would come up with very different ideas that I, I know, well, actually the likelihood of that working probably is pretty low from my experience. Um, and then it'd be like, well, how would you know? And you know, well, we have to test it. I'm like, well, do you have to test it? There's secondary research. Like, have, have you read these books? Like there's, there's a whole history of like decades of experiments that have been run previously. Like, do you think one of the missteps in experimentation is a lack of secondary research in the first place? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, we hear that a lot from our clients uh, at Do What Works, and, and so I don't, I don't want to make it sound like a, like a plug here, but but the one of the most interesting things we hear, especially as organizations get larger, is that the more people there are in an organization, the more opinions there are. And the more you have to sort of field requests from this team, requests from that team, requests from this this organization, maybe somebody went and had drinks with some other business leader and they come back on a Monday morning and say, I heard about this, we should really try this. And now you got to, now, now product roadmaps get thrown out and everybody's got to do that. Um, that's true at all size organizations uh, is, the, is the sad truth. And, you know, it's sort of one of those things we were describing. I like to joke that product management is, is a team sport. But in some cases, it's a full contact team sport. It's like rugby or American football in, in that regard, right? And so uh, there's things flying at you and there's imperfect data. And so what one of the interesting or unexpected use cases for me in our product has generally been the use of product, like product leaders using our data when the boss comes in and says, I just saw an article on this and we should really do this because it worked for company X, Y, and Z. Uh, we should switch all of our imagery to, to, to illustrations Well, they can now go and look up and be like, okay, let's look up all the experiments that involve illustrations versus, uh, versus stock photos versus product imagery or et cetera. And we can now see like for our industry, does that make sense? Or is it just a passing fad that you just happen to latch in on? Um, and, and so it's one of those things like, again, where because you don't have the data beforehand, you could play the whole thing out and see the dang thing launch and get the results and then say to your boss, oh, I guess that was what we expected to happen. <laughs> or you can try and fend it off at the start with the use of data, like you're saying. And so wherever you can get the signal, get the signal to, to save you the time. But you're 100% right in terms of, it's, again, it goes back to that fallacy or that the unfortunate truth, which is that we all sort of believe so strongly that, this, that the way we use things is how everyone else will use it. Uh, and look for, uh, and to your point, I think not beyond my own product, it's like, what's the disconfirming evidence that you can find? What's the, mm -hmm. how can you pursue and find things that invalidate your point of view? Uh, and it, in the absence of being able to find that, then it's a good idea to move forward. Yeah, I like it. Okay. And we have mentioned sort of different phases of business. And I really want to sort of nut down into this because you had some really good examples around how to pre-validate an idea. So let's just um go through a bit of a story from like maybe the inceptions of a business idea um pre-market validation entering market you know a bit of a sort of early growth phase high growth phase and then maturity decline um and how we might use experimentation what it looks like what resources we're using what, what sort of tools we're using that kind of thing from start to finish so um just bear with me here but let's just go really back to the start so because um, you have this really good sequence of questions to ask around uh, validating your business idea. Mm -hmm. So let's just say, you know, if, if the listeners listening right now, they've got this business idea or this, they've always wanted to start a, a tech company or whatever, or maybe it's a, it's a product idea or an, an initiative within their, their company. So very, very early stage, very greenfield. Um, now, what would you do to sort of like 
pre-validate those assumptions without getting too heavy. Yeah. So I would one start by isolating the the first question, which is generally does the person you're you think have has a problem, do they actually have a problem? And does your brilliant idea for how to solve it actually make a difference to them? So the first question is, does anyone care? All right. And then the second question, like if, if they don't actually have a problem, if they don't care, if they don't care to take your call, they don't care to solve it, then there's nothing there. Then the next question is, if they care, do they like the approach you're taking to solve it? Does that actually make a difference? And then in more and more, depending on the nature of the industry, it's sort of, is somebody willing to pay for that solution? Be it the end user, be it their boss, be it an advertiser. Are there enough people that are willing to pay for it? Oh, and the, this question number one, can you sell it to them? Can you sell it to more than one of them? <laughs> and then uh, those are sort of the first series of questions that you might want to answer. There's a, uh, there's a series more that would follow as you start, as sort of think about how to scale that up. Like, can you find more people like them? Can you do that in a way that's cost effective? But if those are the questions at first, then the thing is, what is the most basic way of proving out that people have this problem? What is the most basic way of proving out that your solution works, right? Um, and so it could I mean, just be I, getting an before, off the shelf actually, solution. Um, There's a great example where. Yeah, so you, you go. Go ahead. Oh, well, um, well, I mean, even I at like a doing, very late uh, stage, go ahead. Sorry, um, I was doing a lot of pretesting in Uber. So I would um, pitch my idea to people in elevators or people I was meeting like, hey, if you know, what do you think of this idea? Blah, 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 blah. And then sort of get some at least if I did that like 10 or 50, 20 times, um, I'd at least get some sort of yes or no answer from that, like pretty quickly. Like if a lot of the majority said, I, I, I don't get it, I would just use XYZ substitute or something, or, you know, why would that make a difference, blah, blah, blah. You then have objections that you have to handle and I would then reformulate the question and then refine maybe what the product could be in my mm -hmm. mind and then pitch the, another 10 or 20. And then pretty quickly you get to this point where you're like, oh, you've got this like one or two sentence pitch that people are going, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would probably, you know, look into that. And then, of course, you're going to do the next step, which is financial validation. Um, you had a really good, um, interesting thing that you did um, early on with your with your new current product, which was just like a Stripe page, for example. Like, how did how did you go with that early <laughs> sort of phase? Because I think the story is really interesting. Yeah. So I love the methodology you're describing. Methodology is really great. The one refinement that I might offer is is that it helps to not just describe an idea or to pitch it. But I do love pitching things as a way of knowing, but pitching it with a proof point, with something that people can react to, because oftentimes my words uh, paint a different picture in your head than the word that, than the picture that's in my head as it's coming out. And so it's not always true that the, the two people, when they, it seems like they're aligned, when there's a lot of agreement, are actually in agreement until they're both watching and reacting to a thing. In, in our case, we built this technology initially as a toy that allowed us to detect the experiments that anyone was running. And so we had the data in and of itself for ourselves in a really rough and raw and crude way. We showed it to my friends in product and growth companies. And we said to them, hey, this is interesting to us because we've been doing this for a while, but is this interesting to you? And they said, yes. I said, would you be willing to pay for it? They said, yes. I said, would you be willing to pay X dollars a month for it? They said, yes. I said, if I send you a Stripe form tomorrow, will you fill it out? <laughs> and they said, yes. Right. And then we did, we sent them a Stripe form. So the only thing that was on the web that exists for do what works. So if you went to do what works at IO, the only thing you would see was a simple Stripe form with like a way of collecting the credit card payments. And we got three people to pay us um, a monthly fee in exchange for a product that was going to be delivered in a really rough and crude way. We initially promised we'd send them PDFs. We actually never delivered the PDS. We built the dashboard very, very quickly. And we got them a, a, a dashboard faster than, than we had promised. And then that dashboard became the V0.1 that allowed us to then start growing and finding more customers like the ones we'd had before and refining the product. Because the next series of questions like we, we can go into is like, okay, they said they liked it. They used it once. Are they going to use it again the next month? Do they keep using this problem? Is it a problem they keep having? Are they willing to keep paying for it? Are they willing to tell their friends? Are there more people like them? Can we sell it? Can we sell it at scale? That, that's how we basically started solving it. Um, and just in the nick of time, because right around then I had to decide between taking a very high power job 
that was going to willing, willing to pay me a lot of money or turn it down and, and go on this entrepreneurial journey. And actually funny enough from like money where your mouth is for me, um, I turned down the high power job to actually pursue and turn this toy into a company uh, because of those three stripe payments that we got, uh, you know, way back when. But also, I really like the story of um, of Meetup. So um, for people who don't know, you were one of the very early employees at, at, at Meetup um, back in the day before, and you mm -hmm. pretty much went through all the way until, until it's the exit. Um, but very early on, um, you had a colleague That's that right. you used to work with at a digital agency who was, who was the founder of Meetup. Is that right? Or? Yeah. 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 So the, the company yeah. that I flew across country to take a pay cut for, he was the CEO. Uh, and when he was starting Meetup, he called me up and he said, hey, I'm about to start this new company. You want to be a part of it with me? And that's how I got involved very early on uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Meetup journey, for sure. Yeah. Scott Heiferman was the founder of Meetup. He was also the founder of that first online agency called iTraffic, uh, which is the connection there. Nice. Okay. And um, there's a really good story where you, he got you, one of the first things to do was to validate this, this restaurant model. And you asked some very interesting sort of what I would call almost sales prospecting sort of questions and you handle objections very well mm. in this sort of secondary answer here. Um, can you tell me sort of like, I don't think a lot of people know how Meetup started. So like, what was the first sort of traction you did there to get that growing and, and the restaurant call story? <laughs> Yeah, it's really funny. So when Meetup launched, it um, was nothing like what Meetup is like now. It was a very different model whereby uh, a computer in New York would randomly assign people to go to locations, uh, which is where the Meetups would occur on a specific date related to a specific interest. So we um, had a hypothesis that it would be valuable to restaurants, it'd be valuable to cafes and bars to be able to host meetups because what is that? That's foot traffic coming through the door with people who are, you know, could become customers and spend money there. So that was the hunch when meetup, you know, got going and, you know, talk about those bets. One of the biggest bets in the world is like that strangers are going to leave their computers in 2002 and go meet somebody at a cafe and talk about Xena, the warrior princess, or talk about, you know, <laughs> their love of Manchester United or whatever the case may be. Those were kind of bold bets at that point. Um, in time, but that part was starting to, there was signal that that was working. And so we wanted to prove out the revenue model. So the bet was that a venue would be willing to pay for the right to host a meetup. We, um, <laughs> we then, uh, so, so how do we prove that? I got a list of the places where meetups were going to happen. And I just started cold calling them. And the first one I called was Ben's Chili Bowl in Washington, DC, which as it turns out is a very famous institution. I had no idea at the time. I'd never heard of them before, but Ben's Chili Bowl in Washington, D.C. I called them up. I said, we're sending you 14 people next week. If you'd like to keep, if you'd like, I can do that every week. It would just cost. And he said, yeah, that'd be interesting. He said, how much would that cost? I said, a dollar a person, $14. Uh -oh. And he said, uh, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> and so sure enough, I got off the phone and I thought we had struck gold. I was like, this is going to be the biggest business ever. I've got a hundred percent hit rate. And so I called the next person on the list. And they told me to just buzz off. And I called the next person. They told me no. And the next person, no. But what was interesting is as I called people, after I talked to them, after they said no, I would say to them, look, I'm not going to pitch you anymore. I won't take your money if you try and give it to me. Like, I'm not selling you right now. But can I ask you, was there anything about what I just said that was interesting to you? Anything at all? And they said, well, getting more traffic is good, but I don't care about getting more people on a Friday night. I got to line out the door on a Friday night. But if you can give me people on a Tuesday afternoon, my restaurant's empty then. I'm really, that, that'd be much more interesting to me. And so very quickly after doing this process of like giving a pitch, hearing no, asking what would be interesting and refining it with the next person, within like 20 to 30 calls, I pretty much honed in on a pitch that was pretty darn good. Um, and it was good enough to be able to, um, to raise money on for us. So, so, you know, built a team around it. I then, um, as it turns out, I went back to business school at that point, uh, for a couple of years, but I handed that part off. Uh, but that was good enough to help meet up, get its, uh, its first round of financing with, you know, a revenue model, which, uh, was, uh, we were raising at a time when, um, it was just after the dot com bust the first one. And so it was a real problem and, uh, it was like a real important thing to be able to prove revenue. And so that was kind of a really cool key thing that we were able to do at that point. But it all basically unfolded by getting that rapid feedback, much like the process you described, John. 
Yeah, I really like that story because um, like similar to right now, it's actually pretty hard to get funding depending on what sector you're in. If you're in AGI, maybe less so. Um, but like for a lot of other sectors, the same mm-hmm. kind of thing. It's revenue fundamentals. It's it's hard. You need to prove traction and, and positive cash flow or, or positive view economics at the very least. Um, so for me, I think um, maybe some of the mistakes that I've noticed um, very early stage companies make here is that they, they hide behind sort of digital analytics platforms and they're analyzing that as the key to, you know, validate in your business model where they could easily find that out through making some phone calls. So I think, you know, for me, that is a form of experimentation that you did. It was like an iterative mm. experimentation that any good salesperson would do um, at the start. It's very grubby, it's phone calls. But I think, you know, do you think some people maybe uh, exclude that from the experimentation set because, or talking to customers for that matter, or prospects or whoever, yes. um, because it's a bit more comfortable putting an analytics program, you know, analyzing data and then go, oh, okay, well, that's a winner. For sure. I mean, people who love pattern recognition, people who love data generally um, do not love sales. (laughs) That's not, that's not entirely true. I should say this. I should frame frame it this way. Um, As a, as a co, as a, as as a co-founder, as a CEO, as somebody who launched this business, it's very important for me to learn how to do sales. But what is my, what's my happy spot? My happy place is, is working in product. My happy place is in a spreadsheet. It's, it's actually like, thinking about the systems and the patterns more so than the, the hardcore, you know, the hard truths of just being told no and, 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 and uh, working through the, the, just the slog of it for sure. Um, but that being said, what's, what's fascinating is, is um, you can systematically vary anything with, in terms of how you engage with people to run experiments. It doesn't have to be purely through like a technology or an analytics dashboard or through a, an AB testing platform, like, like uh, optimizely, like for example, we ran a test at Meetup, which took months to do, but we heard that the first 100,000 people who signed up for Flickr were greeted by one of the three founders. And we said, that's really cool. That's a really cool thing to do. So we had a platform, in our platform, we had the ability to reach out to people through, and so what we basically did is we took every new person who registered for Meetup for some period of time. And we started reaching out to them, um, but we didn't reach out to every single one of them. We reached out to 80% of them and we had a 20% holdout sample. And we wanted to see, does reaching out and just saying hello to a new organizer, not every member, but to a new organizer who are very, very important to making a meetup happen. Does reaching out make it more likely, make them more likely to be successful, to stick around, to keep paying us, which is where our revenue came from. And so we ran it as a test where every single time, every day, you know, the, the customer support team would reach out to eight out of 10 people that signed up. They'd hold out 10. And so we ran that for about a month and we tracked every single person who was doing it the way that we, we implemented it. And we found that, can you guess what we found, John? I'll, I'll make it a guessing game for you. Well, it's, it's a trick question. Say, we found there was no were... impact. Oh, really? No impact. Wow. Except... For two people, there was an impact with two people. And we're like, (laughs) why did these two people make a difference? And these other, everyone else didn't. And we're like, is it a a gender thing? And we're like, nope, one's a a guy, one's a girl. That's not the thing. Is it, um, you know, a hair thing? Nope, one has hair, one doesn't have hair. It, it uh, it, it It was a pattern. We couldn't realize what, except for one thing, which is the two of them sat next to each other. And what we discovered is that they went off script they broke the rules of the experiment and instead of just saying hello which is all we intended to do they reached out and they said hello but then they sent an email in the background with specific tips for them because they noticed that they could do x y and z better and they had a statistically significant lift on activations and retention and so then we recreated the experiment with everyone using their methodology with an 80% holdout, with the 80% with 20% holdout set. And sure enough, it actually worked across the board. And, and so is that, you know, an optimizely platform? No, I mean, it's, it's literally just around saying I have a list of 10 people or a list of 100 people. I'm just not going to reach out to 20 of them today. I'm gonna, and I'm going to watch them over time. And that's all it takes. It doesn't have to be, you know, capital E experimentation. It doesn't have to be purely scientific in a way that would get you, you know, permission to put a pacemaker in somebody's body or, or put a person on the moon. 
Um, as long as it's like close enough to, to the truth, you can get there fast with a lot of error and be much still more likely to beat the 80% benchmark that the world is up against. Okay. So not everything has to be a, like a I'm gonna say 80% percent benchmark. It's 80% percent fail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I like it. So not everything has to be like a, this crazy, like, you know, 5% margin of error, 95% confidence interval to, to be proven. I mean, unless not everything has to be, there's a time and there's a place. And again, towards your storyline in terms of where you were also starting, which is kind of going back to the, well, there's the early stages. And then as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, once you reach a certain scale, or once you're in like putting stuff inside people's bodies and the consequences of being wrong are very, very large, the consequences of being right or being wrong are very, very large, then it does make a lot of difference to be very scientifically sound and to be at the 95% or better interval, right? Uh, confidence okay. interval. Um, but if you don't have the volume, if you don't have, uh, to be able to get the learning fast enough, if it's going to take you a half a year to learn that, is it worth spending the time to be at the 95% mark when you could maybe get to the 85% mark in one or two months time or with enough directional data? Can you get to the place, uh, can you get signal about what's likely to work faster? and live with a little bit more risk, live with a little bit more error in exchange for more velocity of the things that are more likely to work. Um, yep. And so, like yes, it. at the largest scale, those incremental changes, you know, the blue, blue colors on Google make a dang, like a huge bit of difference when you're dealing with billions of, of searches. That's a lot of money. Um, does the color of blue on my site make a difference? No, it won't make it maybe, but it, will I ever feel it? No, because I just don't have enough traffic on it. Okay, great. So this early stage, very scrappy. Use the resources that you already have, whether it's you as the founder or your salesperson or your customer service team. Don't need a lot of tech. Um, as long as you've got sort of approval from whoever, the senior decision maker, then just like go and do it and, and don't be too caught up in, in how uh, valid the results are you know, to, to an extent anyway. Um, what about then the next phase? Right. Let's just say we're a bit bigger now. Uh, we've got a bit of traction. We've got a customer base, like some sort of like semi-critical mass where if, We've got confidence with investors that, hey, we may be onto something here. We're sort of growing to that sort of one mil ARR mark, right? Which is, I think, the sort of the next phase. Um, when we're then doing experimentation at, at this stage of the company, um, just can you describe to me, like, sort of what staff have we got at the minute? What budget do we have? What tools are we using? And sort of what support do we need to get um, at a sort of senior level here to start doing this next phase? And what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah, it's like such a cool question. I mean, you can almost think of it as like the phase one was the was you could describe as let's figure it out phase. Yep. The does it work phase, right? And the next phase is can we make it work for a lot more people phase? Okay. Right. And at that phase, the nature of the challenges change a lot to, okay, um, what are the ways in which we can get this to work for a lot more people? Uh, and there's sort of two sides to that problem, which is generally around how do you get a lot more people? And then how do you contain your costs along the way to that? But that might even be containing the cost might even be a phase three thing, depending on, on how you want to think about it. From a getting more people point of view, um, then it becomes a lot around sort of um, what are the bets around channels? Even if you're making a million dollars a year in revenue, it doesn't give you a ton of resources to be running a lot of marketing experiments. You, you, you only get a limited number of, of shots in terms of things you can spend to, whatever, even if you spent all your million dollars on, on that, which would be um, pretty aggressive for depending on the nature of the company, if you're, if you're bootstrapped uh, or, you know, if you're maybe not so much of your VC backed, but it, you still have a limited amount of channels. And so it's around, how do I quickly figure out the methodology by which I could repeatedly get more customers in a certain way? Um, and it's sort of a rinse and repeat. Now we're looking at all the different possibilities and what's the signal there. Um, that size team is going to really depend on the nature of the product and the, and the, and the opportunity. But there's sort of one element is you're building at your marketing team and you probably need a large enough team to be able to place like two to three bets or very quickly figure out bets there. You probably want to use a lot of outsourced people very quickly, um, to figure out the, the things that are likely to work or not get a lot of expertise, get a lot of, uh, bang for your buck really, really quickly. Um, to um, hone in on the thing that's likely to work and to launch it with the absolute best likelihood of working at that juncture uh, by virtue of borrowing somebody else's expertise or you're borrowing somebody else's ladder uh, in, in that regard. 
Um, and the nice thing about that is if you do it with contractors or consultants, you can keep them or, or not, depending on um, whether or not it's actually an appropriate strategy for your business. So that's sort of around getting more people. On the product side, there's so many challenges at that point around how do you keep to your knitting and deliver on the value and the promise of what you're delivering and get yourself the iterations to actually smooth out all the stuff you said you'd fix down the road. It's You're fixing your onboarding, you're fixing your, um, your sales pages, you're fixing your kind of things that you said were not that important on like the first phase that we were going to live and die by. You have to go back and clean up so that you can start building the foundation for a long, long-term retention and getting the pieces in place for retention. And so those are probably the two biggest sets of challenges in the let's get more people phase or figure out how to grow this phase, which is let's figure out how to, where can we find more folks? How do we make sure that we're actually delivering on the value and that people keep using us and keep paying for us? And you wanna sort of ask and answer those challenges there. Um, at that size, you're very, very, very lucky if you can get one to two product teams, you know, pods going. And it's just about ruthless prioritization. And um, it's really, really fun, but it's one of those like um, things I really believe that Reed Hoffman put, put it beautifully when he says that you gotta let certain fires burn. Uh, and, and so that phase is just around having a lot of fires burning and just picking the ones that are most important relative to those two problems. Great. And, and you did mention um, this, this, uh... Well, I would say you'd wanting to be seeding sort of the, the mindset or an experimentation culture within the organization at this this stage, right? Um, and maybe the the department is very crude, or you're working with product and it's a bit cross functional, you're using some contractors and everything. But would you want to seed that sort of that that mindset or that process around around the organization? Because I know you mentioned this book. Um, what was it called? Um, the Culting of Brands by Douglas Atkin. Um, and you said like yeah. that early on really was directional in pointing your mind in the right direction. Um, so yeah, what is that book and, and how did that sort of help that experience for you? So, um, that was a book that I found that was profoundly high impact for so many different reasons for me. Um, it was written by a person named Douglas Atkin who, um, studied what, top brands can learn from what he described as cults and very broad definition of cults, everything from like your traditional cults to actually like Harley Davidson motorcycle groups and, and various others. And sort of what is, a, what does Harley Davidson have in common with traditional cults? Uh, that book was a profound influence for me because in reading it, we reached out to the author and got him to agree to join us at meetup. And so he became my boss. He became the head of marketing at meetup. Uh, and then he became, uh, wow. after leaving meetup, he became the chief community officer at Airbnb. And he, uh, is, I think partially credited. I think, uh, he, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you, you can give him a lot of credit for sort of their belong anywhere ethos at Airbnb originated from him. Um, wow. but what's fascinating about that book and that book is less around sort of experimentation, but more or, and more around how do you build culture and how do you build community? Um, the most fascinating takeaway from that book is in fact, that what cults, great and great communities and great brands have in common is that you don't lose yourself to the cult. You don't, people think that when you join a cult, you sort of lose your identity, but the reality is that it's actually the inverse being in a cult being a part of the Apple culture, being in a motorcycle group allows you to feel more the, the feel like, like yourself only more so. And so a cult allows you to like, take those parts of you that feel isolated and to really make them part of like the front and center of you, of who you are. And so when you see people who, you know, for whatever, this is such an American example, but, but, um, but with a Harley Davidson group, there's sort of like when you see a pack of people riding Harleys, there's a certain sort of behavior that is intrinsic to, to like the rider that reveals itself maybe in a way that wouldn't bring itself out that you wouldn't see when that person is just walking down the street by themselves. Um, well, and array, so being uh, in the community or, or a Trump photo or, you know, anyone really military, ex-military. Anyone really. I mean, like and, and you, yeah. 
Absolutely. But even like Apple, what, what do, like, why do people love Apple so much? Because it sort of allows them to feel like they're the most creative versions of themselves. It's, it's, it's a better technology. I, I think I use an Apple, but like, I, why do I love the brand? It's because, you know, that, that whole uh, think different campaign and what did it do? It gave you permission to say, if you were creative, you are one of us. And this is your highest form of creativity will be realized when you have our products, our, you know, when you're a part of who we are. And that's why people go to Mac world and, and are like huge devotees to this. Similarly with, um, there's a cult that exists around, um, or I guess a community that exists around, uh, Elon Musk and, and Tesla and, and various others as well. So, um, yeah, so that was, those were the takeaways from, from that specific book that, that are really profound. Anyone who's thinking about building community, um, you must read that book and you must read the purpose driven church by Rick Warren. Um, which is an unbelievably great book that documents how he built a mega church, like one of the biggest churches in the world, um, through, uh, the practice of cellular communities. Wow. Okay. I love it. Um, and obviously like, you know, meetup was kind of like a, a cellular community in a way, like you started to, and we'll get to this. Okay. Let's go to the next phase. Um, because, <laughs> um, really fascinating, but, um, let's say we go to the traction phase. We've got like one mil to four mil ARR is kind of the next sort of phase, I would say. Um, and, you know, you, you said, because this is a really good segue, you said you were noticing users were using the product in a different way that you hadn't had envisaged. So you, you started to notice these local leaders start to pop up and, and then the sort of, there was a bit of a pivot mm -hmm. in the business model away from you organizing events to then outsourcing that to other people to be leaders of those events. And you sort of mentioned this is kind of where the flywheel started to kick in and you created a lab off the back end of this. But um, yeah, just, just run me through that sort of next phase and, and how the experimentation sort of um, department, if you will, um, sort of morphed from something earlier stage to something a bit more complex. Yeah, so there was a profound phase shift, you know, much like the difference between water and ice or, or water and air, uh, water and evaporated, uh, water, uh, very, very different, uh, things, although they're very similar. Um, both the, the original approach that was taken by meetup to get people into a room together, uh, what was observed early on was that people were doing it, but there were two major problems, which is one is that it was uh, so much work for them to coordinate. And so it's hard to get them to keep coming back. And then two is that what we, what was noticed was that there was, um, a lot of people were adopting Yahoo groups, uh, which is a thing at the time. Uh, and, uh, they were using <laughs> online, uh, technologies, basically listservs to, um, to organize the events with meetup being the engine that drove the acquisition of those folks. And so as a result, a very, very, very bold bet was taken, um, that I can't take any credit for, but it's a very bold bet that was taken. That was essentially about sort of um, throwing out everything about how Meetup worked at the time and relaunching it with an organizer and member model and using a cellular structure there to allow people to create their own local Meetup groups about the things that they cared about where Meetup would be the engine that made it easy to do. Um, but it was about sort of taking the all the control, which was at the computer in New York City and suddenly distributing it to every single city Every single topic, the intersection of every city and every topic, suddenly individuals in those local towns were empowered to step up and become the organizers of those groups. And with that shift, it profoundly changed the flywheel for Meetup because now um, what ended up happening is that organizers created better events, which attracted members. And when members were attracted to those events, those uh, members ended up saying, I love that. Um, Interesting enough, I love that motorcycle group that's happening here, but it's a little far away. I wish there was one closer to me. I'm going to create one closer, closer to me. And so they'll create one, you know, in their hometown. And then that will sort of create a new hold. And what happens then? Well, all these new members get attracted to it and they become organizers and the new members become organizers and the new members become organizers. So it created this flywheel. And that was this amazing way of, of having this growth engine for the ongoing user behavior, for the ongoing value creation, which is people creating value for each other. Um, as we scaled That's and as we grew awesome. the prop, yeah. Well, as we scaled and as we grew, I think you said, <laughs> no, 
There's there's a little bit of a lag here, John. So, so I'm having a hard. Time. Like, there's so much what, of a lag. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's like five seconds or something. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, by the time I pick it up, but I'll, yeah. So so essentially, what ends up hap what ended up happening then is that the shift turned from um, there's a basically like a, a profound system or a model, and then this, the question became, can you turn knobs and dials on that user experience to take away frictions, to take away parts of the experience, or to change around the experience? in ways that could unlock that basic dynamic. And so what okay. we um, invested a lot into was around and where experimentation started to come in and become a more profound impact on, on Meetup was with that base level of traffic, there became questions of, well, what, how do you design the user experience to attract an organizer? And when they're stepping up, how do you motivate them to do it? And for a new member, how do you collect the right information from that member? How do you um, keep gathering information from them to know what they want? How often do you send the communications to them? What do those communications look like? And so it became increasingly an optimization challenge. And the more optimized we became, the more we were able, the flywheel was able to operate effectively. And so that created a lot of emphasis on our part to be able to be better at running conversion optimizations on everything. Um, and we also had the scale at which to do that. So we were doing that both in the product and then we were doing that through our usability lab that we created as well inside of Meetup to be able to watch people use our products or the things we we're working on to, again, maximize the odds that the things that we launched were, were things that people were likely to use or were going to use. And, and the way we did that was literally just by watching them use the stuff we were thinking about launching. <laughs> it's really that simple. Uh, it's, we, we invented a really, really, really cool lab that ran about 400 experiments a year. So um, two or three a day on any given day. We didn't know what was going to be tested. We would just have people scheduled to come into the office. Um, and then a note would go out to product leaders at, during the day saying, hey, we have three people today who's got something they want to put in front of users. And then we would put it, uh, someone would say, I do. And they would get it to the moderator. And then the moderator would uh, actually like walk the user through, walk, walk, walk the person through the experience or have them go through a session. Um, that wasn't necessarily a walkthrough, to be honest. It was more of a, it was more of just a, a moderated session uh, where they would watch the music, and they, we would use a precursor to Zoom to then broadcast that to people's desks uh, who were building the stuff, and they could then talk through IM to the moderator to ask questions, uh, almost the way that a newscaster has an earpiece in their ear, uh, and there are folks in the control room that are asking questions. And so it was a way of getting a lot of really rapid feedback through a system that was optimized to shorten the amount of time between anyone wondering how somebody would react to something and watching them react to it instead. I really and like the story. Um, boy, do you want um, to feel humbled? They were t yeah, I know. But I, I think the two things that really stood out, because I used to do focus group transcription. So I used to um, transcribe in the room as the focus group was going on while the moderator was moderating the focus group. So this is kind of like a variation of focus group, but it's, it's a bit different, but similar sort of thing. It had to be a trained moderator because a lot of human bias creeps into leading questions and, and things like that. So I noticed that you said that you hired a trained moderator and that was a key piece, you know, a professional that would come in, you know, casually or part-time. Is that, is that correct? Well, we started by hiring professionals and we got their playbook and then we very quickly threw it out the door. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, because they brought with them, and I'd love to hear your point of view on this, considering your background there and you're in the room doing focus groups. Um, they brought with them a point of view on how to be scientifically sound in a qualitative research. And by the way, the, the advice they gave us was great. They actually around don't 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 lead don't lead with moderated question don't don't lead with guided pointed questions. Frame it things in a certain way. Set up the situation in a certain way. Set up a session in a certain way. Uh, but the rest of the sort of conventional wisdom that comes with qualitative research is not really needed. It, like the advice they gave us, for example, was to um, spend money to have eight people come in over the course of a day. But instead of having eight people come in, hire an extra person to come in, a ninth person to sit around waiting in case one of those eight people doesn't show up. Why would you do that? Because usually the standard convention is you rent a weird room in the middle of nowhere 
with two way mirrors mm -hmm. and that's expensive. Mm -hmm. And then you hire a professional moderator and that's really expensive. And you write a script because you sort of are anticipating all the things that are going to happen, which in and of itself is like bonkers. Like, of course you don't know what's going to happen. How could you write a script? You're writing, you're running a session, you're asking questions. And then the reason you have a person sitting on the sidelines is in case one of the people doesn't show, now you can sort of slot them in. Our attitude was, well, what if we just did this in our office? If somebody doesn't show, everyone just goes back to work. You just go back to work for another hour <laughs> and then come back an hour later. <laughs> and so what we ended yeah. up doing is just sort of taking all these things and saying, well, what if, why, why do it that way? Why do it that way? All you really need to do in the simplest form is strip it down, hire a person. And we actually ended up hiring people out of the community or out of our community team. We're actually the best people that, and I would train them on being moderators. And if you can teach people uh, very quickly, and they certainly got thrown in the deep end on how to moderate and how, how to ask the right questions, you can design a system where you're getting really rapid feedback, um, watching people use the stuff you build and broadcasting that or even recording it and shipping it to your team after the fact. Um, using tech tools. So today it's never been, e it's never been easier to do. It's as easy as it's ever been. It's can be really cheap and you can almost hand over controls now using so much technology. It's insane. There's no reason not to do it. Um, so yeah, we didn't actually use the professional moderator. We, we hired them and then we drove them crazy and then we rewrote the rules. Hey, but um, counter to that then, um, I think what's used now, I'm not sure this wasn't too long ago, but, um, you know, there's programs like full story, you know, Hotjar can do screen recordings. A lot of, um, your programs now, analytics programs come with this sort of like a, a session recording thing. And so counter to that point, why would I go to the point of doing usability testing when I can just record like a sample of users, you know, watch them through with my product team and then sort of like hint at what may, what be going on and why they're using it a certain way and then sort of draw yeah, things from that or hypothesis and test that. Like that's the counterpoint. I mean, what would you say to that? It's, it's a really good point. And it's um, the reality is that you don't, there is no one perfect tool and there is no uh, one, one solution for everything. The, a service like Hotjar, which I love, I don't know. I like the people there too. They're really good people who work there. Um, they are awesome, but what are they going to reveal to you? You're going to watch the behavior and that's as authentic as it's going to get it's it's really true and there's a there's an advantage there what are you not going to get the ability to understand what the heck has gone in their mind <laughs> what are they thinking what's going on what are they trying to do you don't know you just like you wish you could jump through the screen and be like hey why are you doing that it's over here did you not see it or are you trying to solve something else what are you what's on your mind today what what is it that you're, you're coming here to try and solve for um and the beautiful thing about a usability session is that you can ask that question. What's the, the, the terrible thing about it? You're sitting in a room next to somebody. It's as contrived as it could be. So it's really hard to get a truth. And, and all we're doing is triangulating between those two things on the behavior. You throw usability, you throw you know, research in, uh, in the form of, of, of qualitative and quantitative studies. You throw surveys in, you throw A-B testing in the mix. And together you start to round out the picture of the ultimate truth that is what somebody's trying to satisfy or what they're trying to do. Um, and that's, there is no one right tool. There is no one right solution, but the closer you can get to it, I would pause it. The more likely you are to be very, very successful as a product leader, as a growth leader in trying to get a behavior to occur. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And then let's just say we've, um, we've got a successful business. We've, we've exited, perhaps um, like you, you did at Meetup or, or Meetup did and then sold to WeWork, you know, as everyone knows. And then we go through this kind of maturity phase. And a lot of people have asked me recently, and I know you don't work there anymore, um, but um, hey, what happened to Meetup? You know, what, what happened there? And, you know, oh, I used to have this big community and then I was gone. Like maybe let's just set the situation where in a company which is past that growth phase, maybe competitors are coming in. It's a lot more saturated than it was. Um, some you know, original people have left or whatever, and sort of growth is stagnating or it's declining or it's just you know in a bad place. Um, how would you use your mm -hmm. skills to to reverse that or, or diagnose what's going on? Yeah, um, there's a lot of questions in there uh, yeah. as well that I can Everyone pack together as tests. well. So a couple, yeah, couple yeah. of notes. I'll answer it in general, and then I'll also... 
Yeah, now I'll reference, I'll, 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 I'll share some thoughts in there too, but also just give a little color on, on Meetup as well. So um, obviously, um, you know, they got sold. There was a, um, being part of the WeWork engine for a little while is actually really a fun, weird, wild ride. And I'll, I'll say that that for all the bad rap that WeWork got, the people at WeWork were unbelievable. Uh, there were really great people that had like a real can do like attitude and an ability to sort of make something happen. Um, and they built a really cool product. So there's a lot of good, good things that, um, were happening amidst all of the stuff that's been reported as well. That were also a little wild. Um, and then, um, I left me up a long time ago, so I don't have a horse and rice excited from the fact that, that, I, that I just, I love the brand and love what we stood for and what we accomplished. Um, but they also, unfortunately for them, they also did hit a pandemic. <laughs> that that forced people to be inside for for a good chunk of time. So I'm sure that that didn't necessarily help. But but as far as uh, you know, a, a meetup is still is still alive and kicking. Although I, I don't I haven't been to a meetup personally in a long time. In part because now, you know, the pandemic has taught me to do everything online and be a hermit. Uh, but to your underlying question uh, around um, ar around the uh, like, how do you deal with it? So it's such a great question. So there's two things you're going to want to do, right? Which is sort of the there's the prisoner's dilemma, not the prisoner's dilemma, the innovator's dilemma around you want, like there's the desire to keep squeezing growth out of a thing that's there and like getting as much revenue as, as you can from it by just like smaller and smaller tweaks and by, by removing the cost as much as possible. Um, there's an analogy that I love, which is the S curve. And I'm not sure if you've seen this, 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 uh, there's somebody put a, a, a blog post out about it, which is just brilliant, but I love this which is that you can sort of describe almost everything or every new venture, um, but lots of things can be described this way as an S curve, which is that on the X axis, there's, a, there's time. And on the Y axis, there's, um, there's impact. And so what is happening with a lot of things is that for the initial period of time, there's so much time being going by and so much effort being put in but the results are not like profound. You're like, why is it so flat? And almost every startup looks this way. And then suddenly things start to like elbow up and like the right combinations of things find themselves. And they're all clicking. And suddenly this thing goes from looking flat to looking like, oh my goodness, this is a straight up hockey stick. And that's usually, you know, where you where the story leaves itself. That's where all the articles get written and the rocket ship and this and the other. But for every single product that exists in that way, and we're actually seeing this right now in some of the social products, which is interesting, there, you, you reach a saturation and it flattens out. And so then the real next question is, well, what is the S curve that follows behind it? And so while you're on that boom time, you need to be investing in that flat time and figuring out what's the next cycle that's coming so that you can sort of have a series, a sequence of S's that are all peaking at the same time. And the world's most amazing and best companies have figured that out. And for all the things you might say about Facebook that are not positive, you got to give them a whole lot of credit because they did actually stack up a bunch of, of S curves in the form of Instagram, in the form of WhatsApp, in the form of like very big bets that really did pay off in a pretty profound way. Uh, and, and so it's sort of that interesting challenge at that juncture, which is almost like rinse and repeat, uh, you know, which is like at that point, um, it becomes a startup inside the corporation and as extremely well chronicled by Clay Christensen, it's just so hard to get the funding or get the momentum going on those kinds of things uh, because it's so small and it's not going to have any material impact for a very long time. But the best companies figure out how to manage a portfolio of the, up and, of the next wave of S's or next bigger bets in a way that draws the signal quickly and have the patience to let it play out or what often happens is they just buy them. <laughs> the more likely story is that yeah, they, yeah, yeah. you sort of have the Instagram story where they get bought, right? That somebody else does all the work, does, does all of that, that, that period of time. And then the bigger corporations come in and sort of slot in those growth stories during the elbow before the saturation point. I love it. Um, so what I was trying to hit out here is, um, and I, I, I want your opinion on this, but um, there's, there's macro growth strategy that, is like these fundamental sort of like acquisitions or big step change things, new product releases, like maybe even just ignoring what's happened before or creating something totally new. Um, that sort of like has these macro growth effects over the whole organization. And then within that, there is more of that tactical sort of optimization side of things where you, you know, you've got the engine built and you're optimizing the flywheel, but maybe that engine is operating within a market that is in decline 
and then everything all your experimentations could be winners but like the whole thing the results are going to be shrinking over time so you know i i sort of make this, this distinction between both and you know this is where some firms in the tech world are now sort of mm. pivoting towards you know brand as as an acquisition channel instead of you know these other um channels that they used to use so you know brand has become everything now brand 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 um and i know that you know there's certain laws around here with brand size has a halo effect on the whole organization makes um hiring easier and makes um acquisition easier at lower cost um it prevents people from churning to a certain extent because you know there's a like a gravitas behind it right so um you know and similarly if we're optimizing websites and i want your objection to this but the bigger the brand, the crappier your website can be, and it'll still acquire customers. The smaller the brand, vice versa, perhaps the better it needs to be, and the, the more you need to be over these these details because you don't have that halo effect um, giving a positive impact. What, what would you think about that statement? It's a really uh, interesting framework and, and way of thinking about it. Um, you can almost think of it as... Um, when a user finds themselves in a store, when a user finds themselves on a website, when a user finds themselves anywhere, a consumer finds themselves anywhere, um, they're sort of faced with inhibiting pressures and promoting pressures. And the promoting pressure, like the inhibiting pressure for most everything, which is sort of unsaid, but is very true, is risk. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to make the wrong choice. I don't want to buy the wrong car. I don't want to be saddled with the wrong pill. I don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, and um, what the brand is essentially there for, in part, is to give the reassurance that it's not as risky as you might think. If there's not a brand, then those other pressures, the other elements have to really be spot on in order to make it like, in order to get somebody over the hump and get them to be able to make a decision or move forward with something. And so the um, the reality is, yes, you're probably right in that regard. Like, you know, the brand can make up for so many uh, failures in a product and in the user experience and in the sales process. It's probably also true that a brand plus those good experiences that the impact would be that much more profound. So you can almost think of a brand as an amplifier, yep. which is whatever the situation is, is either going to make up for it, but in the absence of needing to make up for something, it could probably dramatically amplify. So if um, a dollar invested in not so good ads uh, with a bad brand versus not so good ads with a, with a really good brand, um, it's probably going to amplify itself. The payback will probably be some percent better, 10% better, 20% better than it would have been. But when you pull off a great message and that brand, it's probably, um, I would posit that it's, it's sort of a multiplying effect. It's not additive. It, it's probably like a multiplication of it better. Um, so it's probably 10% yeah. better. And it's probably some brand halo effect, which causes it to not be 20% better, but like 25% or 30% better as a result of being sort of a compound effect. Okay, um, over to you. Um, I, I reckon we could talk a day, but I know i um, have got a time limit on this. So um, and I'll just take up more of your time. So um, one thing you said, 80% of experiments fail, right? Um, imagine if you could reduce that percentage down. And that's kind of what you've done. And you said, like learning in a vacuum, like no one's learning from other people all the time. And this is kind of like the impetus impetus behind why you created this, this product that um, we're about to talk about. But, um, you know, it's a way of preventing making the same mistakes everybody else has prevented. And I, I mentioned sort of one antidote to that, which is secondary research or having our grounding in, in some of these fundamentals like direct response copywriting, um, you know, <laughs> consumer behavior, et cetera. But you've created this tool, which is a bit more specific than that and um, can prevent people from experimenting with things that have already been tested and, and learned from. So can you tell me about um, this product and, and how it works? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Do What Works is a, is a product that we invented to help product and growth leaders do more of what works, essentially do what works, right? And so what we built is a technology that allows us to detect any experiment that's being run on the growth experience, so on the marketing experiences online for any company we care to look at. So to start off with, we said, well, hey, wouldn't it be interesting to find out what uh, the whole thing started as a toy? But we said, wouldn't it be interesting to see what uh, Netflix was testing? 
And wouldn't it be interesting to see what Warby Parker is testing? And we said, what would be a random thing? Wouldn't it be interesting to see what progressive insurance in the United States, some insurance company was testing? And we put our engine on it and we were able to detect it. And it's uh, profoundly interesting if you're super nerdy about, uh, running, like, about running experiments. But the underlying impetus for this is sort of around the fact, like you described, that 80% of experiments don't move the needle. So 80% of things that people try don't work. And my solution to that in the, you know, when I led product and growth at Meetup was I would get together with other product leaders. And, you know, we were friends with people at Etsy. We were friends with people at, uh, at, at Tumblr. We were friends with people at Shutterfly, all these big like New York companies at the time. And we would get together and we'd talk, we basically would do a readout meeting and we'd talk about what our experiments were and what worked and didn't work. And then we would just borrow ruthlessly from each other. And that would save us so much time and would help us piggyback and go to a place where we weren't wasting time on the things that didn't work. And we were really focusing our efforts on adapting the things that our friends were telling us were working for them in a way that made sense for our specific situation. And what we've generally built is try to recreate that. That's the experience that's been in the back of my mind of being in that room with these great people. I want to sort of create that experience online through this dashboard where we're able to help you understand all the experiments that are being run by other people so that you can get the data before you run the test. So we were talking about earlier, the problem with anything that you're going to try is you only get the data afterwards. So what if we give you the data beforehand so that you knew what was more likely to work or not work, and you can then influence your, um, your confidence score actually it could be based on data as opposed to just like who can yell the loudest in a room. And, and that's what we built. So we built this technology now that's looking at uh, 1600 companies on a daily basis, it's a million data points every single day. It's crunching this, this through and it's able to detect any experiment that's being run. We've now found as of today, 15,000 experiments. Literally today we crossed the 15,000 experiment mark where we've analyzed. And we review, we validate, we classify, we publish those experiments to our own dashboard that our clients have their own kind of mini versions of this dashboard. And then our clients also, we provide them recommendations based on the larger trends so that they can uh, proactively optimize their pages and sort of think about what does the right pricing page look like for what I'm trying to do? Should I have strike through prices or should I not? Should I convey it was one plan or three plans? What's the ordering of the plans? How do I think about the imagery? Whatever the questions are. Um, and then every now and again, we also get the, hey, my boss asked me to do this. Do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, and we can help give them data to help uh, either uh, to help fend off that situation sometimes or to actually give them confidence that it is a good use of their time for the next three months. Hey, and I love what someone described um, anecdotally what the, what the product is like. And uh, I'm just going to quote here because it's really fascinating. He said, um, it's like... Skipping the play, uh, skipping the preseason, going straight to the playoffs. I thought it was such a good, good headline. You should put that on your website. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm redoing my my website right now, so I think I will. That's it. That's exactly. Right. I love that yeah. that quote. That person is brilliant. Uh, but no, it's exactly right. Which is sort of there's especially in in uh, in in American sports. There's so many. There's like 82 games of basketball that, that are played before any really interesting basketball actually starts happening during the playoffs, uh, which is really when you should start tuning in and watching. Uh, great. And um, look, I noticed because I tried to sign up yesterday, I noticed you can't sign up. Um, uh, you've got a bit of a waiting list there. Um, you know, you've been doing this for four years, four-ish years now and sort of refining the product, I can assume. Um, when will it be in sort of like a, a public release or are you just, you know, playing the scarcity card here? Hmm? Wink, wink. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's, it's a great question. I love you calling me out on it. So I really do appreciate it. Um, <laughs> it is not a scarcity card. Um, it is a fit thing though. So we are, um, what we've been doing is building it out initially sector by sector. And, and so yeah. the most interesting thing is basically if you're in B2B SaaS, for example, who do you want to learn from? <laughs> you want to learn from B2B mm -hmm. SaaS. And so for us, the rollout strategy was around inviting folks in as we expanded into their sectors. Um, and, you know, now we're huge in B2B SaaS. Now we're huge in streaming. Now we're, um, you know, we got six of the top streaming brands are using our platform, for example. Uh, and we have a ton of really interesting data in that space for them to learn from. We're expanding into banking. We now have banking in there. We have direct consumer health. So a little bit has been around having the right footprint. 
And the other part of it's generally been around having um, just a good fit. It's, it's, a, it's still a little bit of a bespoke process to get a new customer in. And I don't want to go through the process of like launching somebody if it's not a good fit for them. I, I generally believe in creating really good value. Uh, so we could, uh, we've just been more judicious about there being a good fit than anything else um, on that side. Yeah. That being said, we're launching a brand new product that is much more turnkey that is focused on um, advertising. And this is actually hot off the press. This Ooh. is news. Uh, it's not on the website right now. Um, and depending on when this launches, I don't know when the, when the air date on this will be, uh, but um, depending on when this launches, it'll be very, very new. Um, the product uses the same technology that we use on the web to be able to understand what experiments are being run and what's working and not working inside of a website. And it uses that same technology to detect what messages are working and not working in ads that are run on search engine marketing. And so what wow. happens when people run ads on search engine marketing, much like you were saying, their ads are only as good as what they put in. What you put in will be optimized, but it's hard to know what, to, what works and doesn't work. And you have a very limited um, visibility into what's working. And it takes a lot of work to figure out what to write or not work, right? And what we built is a technology that uses our technology, our patented technology to now apply that to search engine marketing so that it understands for any keyword you're running, what ads or what messages resonate and don't resonate. And then it uses artificial intelligence to write headlines based on the winning and losing patterns so that you can okay. go in and upload a new batch of content much more frequently, like on a monthly basis, as opposed to quarterly or even more frequently if you want, based on the winning and losing messaging and get your speed up. So basically it does it all for you and that's rolling out and that's gonna be much more turnkey. And that's the kind of thing that is global overnight that we can launch a much broader audience. So um, that will launch more openly now, actually, I'm literally, I said, I spent the day today, John, right? Like working on the sales page for it. So we're, we're, we're imminently on the, on the verge of doing it. If somebody, if this launches before that, I can give you, I can put out my email address if somebody wants to, to, to get a hold of me, uh, if they do want to get access to it, if, if the product hasn't launched yet. But, but my goodness, I hope it's launched by the time okay. we get this out, by the time you get the podcast so, out. So yeah, no, sure. Uh, so two objections. Okay. Uh, I want to hear your answer to, um, and these are some questions that I asked some people yep. uh, prior to this. Um, they want to ask you, um, how do you know that that experiment is a winner and having a good impact positively on the business? Like, how do you know that they just got the experiment wrong or misinterpreted the results or, um, they don't know what they're doing. Maybe an agency is handling the account and they're not really optimizing for the right metric. What would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Um, the thing I'd say to that is, um, that our platform reflects the experiments that are being run by anyone out there. The interesting thing is we look at things in a certain way. And so we're able to detect what wins and loses based on the patterns by which the experiment is being run. And there's a lot that you can do there. If you understand the pattern recognition to um, build really great technology that allows you to detect what, the variants are in real time, but then also what the winner and loser was. Is it possible that somebody who's running an ad that you want to learn from? So let's say you're competing with Netflix. And is it possible that somebody at Netflix is um, sitting underneath an SVP somewhere and the SVP says, no, we have to launch it with this execution because it's really important to me, even though it didn't win. Like could, could the test have run and could somebody have forced their hand? Yes. It's entirely possible. Mm -hmm. Is it likely that that's going to happen at two companies or three companies or four companies or five companies when you're looking at the exact same thing? No. And so in the same way that any individual experiment in the world of science might be flawed, anything that's like, there's so many experiments that are run in the world of science that are flawed. When you start doing meta analyses, when you start looking at experiments, patterns of multiple experiments, the individual error of any one of those experiments starts to get washed away by the larger pattern of the larger collection of experiments. And as we've now approached a point where we're at 15,000 experiments that are all class categorized with everything from like, 
Is it an image of a human being? Is it an image of a product? Is it an image of a dog? Is it a drawing? The more you can start to stack up and look at those patterns of experiments, you would need every experiment that is involving a, a human versus a product to be flawed in order for the error to be so significant that it would cause you to move in the wrong direction. And so the simplest way of describing this is there's a wisdom of crowds effect. As you start to have yep. a large enough sample, which we've been working our tails off to be able to acquire. And so thank goodness we have that because it's really, really cool to be able to look at those things. Um, and like everything we do and like everything as an industry, except that there's going to be a little bit of error at the unit level. There's the possibility that something might be a little, there might be error prone at the unit level, but at the collection level, when you look at the larger pattern, it will correct itself and it'll allow you to make bets with a lot better odds in your favor than just going at it alone. And okay. so we just other, try to be very transparent and honest with people about that. The other objection was, well, if everyone, let's just say the example of the streaming people, you said you're at the top six. Um, if everyone's learning from each other, everyone's then going in the same direction, regressing to the mean of, of proficiency, right? Which then doesn't give them an edge. Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a question we get from time to time, uh, for sure. <laughs> It sort of relies that the, the question relies on an assumption that the number of things you could try is very finite. Um, and our point of view is that there's actually sort of an infinite number of combinations of things that you might want to try. Um, and what I really hope as soon as humanly possible is that what we can start by doing is getting the, the ridiculous things off the table so we can get people to stop testing the things that everyone tries that, that doesn't work for anyone as fast as possible. So if, if that, once that gets done, hallelujah, I'll be so like, happy. Like, like but the button, next thing that that so does, like, it frees up like button colors or something like blue button. Let's do it. Well, like button colors. I've seen like, oh 50 God. experiments, 50 experiments where people are changing all the buttons from this shade to this shade. And it's like, it never, it never, never makes a difference. There's times when you use button color to call out individual plans. There's, there's nuances there where it does, but the vast majority of times where everyone's like blanket testing one thing, one button color versus another, it just generally doesn't make a difference, at least not, and not at the larger pattern. And so if we could give people the month back that they spent on that and have hundreds of companies not spend a month doing that and instead spend those hundred months on like actually innovative things, then that's going to create the playing field for us to learn and hear, see these new things that are emerging and disseminate those more quickly. So it is a valid critique that as we see cool stuff that's working, it will diffuse, it will become more diffused more quickly, the more successful we become. Um, but it also will create the opportunity for more innovation to be happening. And so that's what I would like to hope is going to happen as a result. Um, and that net net, it'll generate a much more interesting internet for, for the general, for the population at large. No, I love it. Okay. Um, what about, cause you've already mentioned two books that I really like, and that's one of the questions I ask everybody. And I think you have two really, really interesting examples of which I've heard about one, but I haven't read it. So I'm going to read it, the, the Colts one and the other one sounds just mm -hmm. as good. Um, but, um, is there a, you know, just think about your discipline right now. Um, yeah, it can be experimentation or product management or whatever. Um, what is a really interesting quote or meme that is just really true that you really like or makes you laugh every time because it's so true? Yeah, the the the. I'm not sure it's a quote or a meme, but it's a tagline from a TV show I used to watch all the time, which is what I think about all the time. Uh, and I don't know if you remember the TV show The X Files. Do you remember the TV show? Yes. The X Files, yeah, and the, the tagline was "The truth is out there," and, and that's pretty much like sort of the motto for me in terms of the meme, which is "The truth is out there," um, and all we can do is approximate the truth and know that we're never going to get it a hundred like in the world. And uh, all of us who are trying to describe the world, we're never going to fully, perfectly, accurately describe it. But man, the closer we can get to describing it. And the closer we can get to that truth, the, the more good things are going to happen for us. And that's generally what I think about as I think about what decisions can I make 
in terms of how I organize the product, how I run the business, the different kinds of components. There is an old underlying truth that if I can approximate, then I'll be like the things, things will just be easy. And that's what I'm after. I love it. Uh, that's a really good um, note to end on. And um, what if people really liked, um, you know, what we're talking about today, really want to get in contact with you for, for various reasons. What's the most appropriate channel um, where they can sort of start a conversation with you? Yeah. So um, I am most active on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Um, it's really become my go-to. Um, they can, I'll put my email out there. It's a little dangerous, but my email is just Andres, A-N-D-R-E-S at do what works.io. And they get a hold of me through that. But LinkedIn great. is, is also um, just a great way of, uh, of, of seeing stuff. And we, we, we tend to publish a lot of things there. Great. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank Casey Hill as well for intro introducing me to you um, as well. So we were talking about um, I'm actually writing a chapter on, on website copywriting and then your name came up and I was like, oh, actually, it'd be really interesting to talk to you about, you know, website copywriting. Uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of the, the tracking you'd be doing is, is you know, websites or apps or sort of digital interfaces. So I'm sure um, there's a wealth of information uh, you could add to that. So, but yeah, I just want to thank you for your time. Um, I know it went a bit over time, but uh, I think, you know, there's some really interesting things you said and I just love the stories from from meetup and your experience, I, I think, you know, it, it's obvious that you're someone who's been there, done that, um, and not just sort of observing from afar. So thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's been my pleasure. It's funny because Casey's amazing, but I reached out to Casey and he's actually a perfect example of, of when you're starting your marketing program, hire an expert in, in an area and really rely on them. And so that's what we did too. So I hired Casey to help us figure out a key component of our strategy for just, you know, five hours, a five hour chunk. And that was just money really well spent in, in one of those things. So actually it's full circle, but Casey's amazing. I really love the guy. Great. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it.